So often, we live our lives, we have seen the Lord save us. We have seen the Lord deliver. We have seen the Lord provide for our most basic needs. Maybe if you're doing ministry, you have seen Him save people. You have seen Him heal people. You have seen Him giving breakthrough to people. But how many of you know to see the Lord do something is very different from seeing the Lord. Because so often in this journey with Jesus, we, we get so excited and, 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 and I just want to use the word infatuated with, with seeing signs, wonders, and miracles, and it's good. We have seen Him. But my question to you this morning is, do you still see Him? Where is your heart at? I'd like you to turn with me to Deuteronomy 29. Now maybe you are here today and you are like, um, man, this evangelist is incredible. He can not only preach from the Old Testament, he can use the book of Deuteronomy. <laughs> Wasn't my idea. Are we good? Verse 2. We're going to talk about, let's just say we're going to talk hard, not, not H-A-R-D, hard, this morning. And I really like, like felt this morning when the Lord laid it on my heart, like we're going to talk about God, just our hearts, where our hearts is at. You see, Deuteronomy 29 verse 2 says, Moses called all Israel and said to them, You have seen all the Lord did before your eyes in the land of Egypt, to Pharaoh and to all his servants and to all his lands. Now, now, part of why that's such an incredible verse is like, like Moses speaking to them, he's going to talk to them about the covenant, and he says, you have seen all the Lord did before your eyes. Now, when he speaks about Egypt, we know he's talking about when, when, when God delivered Israel from the Egyptians, they had the blood on, on the doors, the angel of death passed over them. So, so that's basically... A, a, a very prophetic, but a picture of our own salvation. So how many of you have seen God's, like, like you know God saved my life? You've seen that, all right? He did it before your eyes. You, you know, like I had my BC days and then after Christ. Like I encountered him, my life changed. And, and part of us, the evangelists or people going out sharing the faith, statistically speaking, and I'm just estimating here, but if I remember correctly, it's almost like 80% of Christians or people that got, like, share their faith only between the first two or in the first two years after getting born again. The most effective evangelist is actually someone who have just given their lives to Jesus. Why? Because you don't rely on a, on, on a method. You had an encounter. And like the Samaritan woman, you went everywhere saying, come behold a man. And then somehow... In that process, we get smart and clever in our own sight. And we neglect these things. Why? Because our hearts cool down. But he said, you have seen all the Lord did before your eyes. Then he goes on. The great trials which your eyes have seen. The signs and those great wonders. How many of you experienced God like delivering you from trials? I mean, for Egypt, it might be the Dead Sea crossing, water in the wilderness, whatever it is. But you know, like if God didn't show up in this circumstance in my life, I might not even be here today. How many of you experienced God delivering you from trials? But then Moses says something that really, like, like just, just jumped at me yesterday. He said, yet the Lord has not given you a heart to perceive and eyes to see and ears to hear. Why am I sharing that with you? So often, we live our lives, we have seen the Lord save us. We have seen the Lord deliver. We have seen the Lord provide for our most basic needs. Maybe if you're doing ministry, you have seen Him save people. You have seen Him heal people. 
You have seen him giving breakthrough to people. But how many of you know to see the Lord do something is very different from seeing the Lord? Because so often in this journey with Jesus, we, we get so excited and, 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 and once you want to use the word infatuated with, with seeing signs, wonders, and miracles, and it's good. We have seen him. But my question to you this morning is, do you still see him? Where is your heart at? He has given us a heart to know him. When he said, you have seen the Lord and all he did is external. But the moment Moses said, he is going to give you a heart, it is internal. What is your life with Christ like? Even, and I know your pastor and, and, and like, like, I mean, you guys are trained. But it's a very real danger, mainly because I made that mistake in my own church. That we go out, we see signs and wonders, and, and we do all these things. And somewhere in that process, we, just because Jesus is confirming his word with signs, wonders, and, God, uh, and, and, signs, wonders and miracles, it is not a confirmation of the messenger. He confirms the message. And so often in our lives, that is why so many people have this question, like, like you'll have preachers in sin and, and all sorts of things, like, like how did God still do wonders, miracles? He confirms the message, not the messenger. And in our own lives, the danger is we are, we are doing these things, we are walking with the Lord, we are working and ministering unto Him. But we forgot or forget the process of like just beholding Him. The Bible says we are trans uh, transformed from glory to glory as through the Lord who is the Spirit. How? Beholding Him. So my question is, are you still having devotional time with Jesus? Not just to get a message to share. Not just to get something to post on Facebook. Are you still going out like, like preaching the gospel or praying for the sick? Not so that you can have something to share on Facebook, but really to say, Lord, this is for you. Well, one time in my life, like we prayed and we see a mighty miracle. And I remember the Lord said, you're not allowed to share this. And, and, and I was puzzled for a bit because I'm like, this is a good one. But I really felt like, like the Lord was jealous and I like, created something. I was like, this is between me and him. He, he does it like we cannot take any glory for it. He said, this is eternal life. That you may see signs, wonders, and miracles. This is eternal life. Some of you just go like this evangelist. Typical evangelist doesn't know the Bible. He didn't say this is eternal life that you may see signs, wonders, and miracles. He said eternal life is to know him. Church cannot save you, for the church did not die for you. Evangelist Bonk is on set. And I'm sharing that. It's like, like, like in my own life, I grew up in church. I was raised. If I say raised in church, my parents weren't pastors. Definitely not. But I, I'm thankful that in their lack of knowledge, they just took me to church every Sunday. And I think at that stage in their lives, not out of conviction or love unto the Lord, it's like, that's what good people did. So I grew up in a traditional church. It's like, I went to church every Sunday. I don't know what, what is angenium and voorgestel? Whatever that word is. But by the time I think I was like 16 years old, confirmed in the church, like, like I remember like well, the reverend in a, at that stage was like friends, and, and, and they kind of like asked us questions, but but he kind of like probably, I would say double, but more like triple. He would ask me questions as opposed to the, like the people who were with me. And I remember afterwards I went to him and I was like, 
Like, why did you ask me so many questions? Because in my mind, I thought, like, maybe I did something wrong. But it can't be that bad because I know what they answered. Like, that's really wrong. Like, like, I remember asking, like, why did you ask me so many questions? And like, you know what's going on. But the problem is I knew the Scriptures just mainly because I've heard them every Sunday. I would read my Bible. I would do good things. Until one day, in Gedomi, a Dutch Reformed minister of all people, literally sat across me like this. It almost felt to me like, like Paul's, like, like, like Ephesian disciples that you read, out, uh, read in the book of Acts, where you, you, the Bible says he encountered believers. And he looked at them and he said, have you received the Holy Spirit? And I really felt like, like this the reverend Kate, the same thing, like, like he listened to me. He didn't ask much questions. He just literally looked me in the eyes and said, are you truly born again? Have you really invited Jesus into your heart? And I remember when he asked me that, the conviction of the Holy Spirit came upon me. I didn't know what it was back then. I just knew that I knew. If I were to die right now, I'm going to hell. I'm not going to Jesus. And he led me in a simple prayer to the Lord. And I remember that like, like the first couple of weeks, the frustration I had was like, the first thought that I had to battle was like, I've been in church my whole life. First of all, if I die, I would have gone to hell thinking I was safe. Secondly, why didn't anyone tell me this sooner? Eyes to see. I think part of, of, of this walk with the Lord Because it, it is a very real danger for us to, to, to walk with the Lord. In, not a danger to walk with Him. The danger therein is that we walk with Him and we see what He's doing. And we think it is enough. So when I'm sharing this morning, it's really like, like, like normally we come in and we would like preach a fiery message and and like, like, like see people saved, and, and, and you still have the opportunity, but I really felt like in my heart what the Lord is inviting this church to today. It's is like, is like to step up into something new, to say, like, I want to give you a heart to know. Not just to see great stuff. And, and I really believe in my heart, it's not, it's not that something's wrong. I really feel, I felt like when I prepared this, like, like when the Lord shared it with me, it's, like an, it's almost like an opportunity Jesus is giving. Saying like, like there, it's more. You know, like Jesus spoke about um, new wine. I'm trying to think about a vein sucker name. Wine skin. <laughs> Near pop suck me. Wine skin. <laughs> but... You know, like the beauty of new wine is new wine goes into a new wine skin. Because a new wine skin can stretch. Jesus himself says if he's going to put new wine into an old wine skin, it'll burst. Why? Because it has hardened. And I believe our hearts are the same. It's like, like he wants to give us new wine. This new encounter is like more with him. But somehow we harden our hearts. How is your heart this morning? So I really trust the Holy Spirit today to destroy the complacency in your heart. Complacency simply means you're actually just happy. It's good to come to church, but it's not enough. It's good to pray, but pray by itself is not enough. Because so often we live this lives like, like I go to church, I pray, I read my Bible sometimes, I tithe. And we kind of like get to that place now where we feel like, I'm okay, it's good. But Jesus is actually this morning handing something to you and say, there is more. 
You know, Jesus in, in John chapter 4, and for lack of time, like, like I'm just not going to read it, but John chapter 4, Jesus comes to a Samaritan woman. The Bible says in John 4, 4, Jesus had to go through Samaria, which is interesting because he, I believe it because the word says it. But the truth is like, like, I was like, like the Bible says he had to go. And I think he had to go not because he had to go through there. He had to go because the Spirit compelled him to go there. So he went to this Samaritan woman. The Bible says he approached her and he asked her, because she was at a well, give me water to drink. And her response to Jesus was, how is it that you, a Jew, ask me who is a Samaritan for something to, to drink? I think that's verse 5 or 6. Because um, the Bible says the Jews and the Samaritans had no relations with one another. So, so this woman, Jesus walks up to her. She's quite surprised, like he's asking for water. Her response is like, you're a Jew. Why are you asking me? Jesus turns it around and he said, if you knew the gift of God and who he is asking you for a drink, you would have asked him for a drink. She looks at Jesus. She says to him, like, like are you greater then our father Jacob, who gave us this well, he and his livestock drank from this. And, and this whole discussion amongst water, Jesus said, like, but the water that I will give you, you will never thirst again. And then she asked him, give me this water. Which was what Jesus offered initially, isn't it? As he said, if you knew the gift, you would ask him. Then she asked him, and he takes her a bit deeper, and he tells her, he says, go call your husband. She, she looks at Jesus and she says, I don't have a husband. And he says, well, you've had five and the one you have now is not yours. So you've spoken truthfully. Which is, which is like, 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 I mean, I'm, we, we can preach all here just on, on that sentence. Like everybody have their own idea. Why did she have five husbands? Some will tell you maybe the husband's abused her because husbands could legally divorce their wives. I don't know the reason she had had five husbands. And then he said, the one you have now is not yours. So I'm not sure if he didn't commit to her or with someone else's husband. I don't know. All I know, Jesus said, you've had five, and the one you have right now is not your husband. Then she tells Jesus these words. She says, I perceive you are a prophet. It's an amazing thing. So we can walk with the Lord. We can have these discussions with Jesus. And still what we see might not be what he is truly there to give. He looks at her. Basically, she asks him, like, I perceive you're a prophet. And then she goes into a discussion about worship. So, like, the Jew says we must worship in Jerusalem. Our forefathers worship on this mountain. And then Jesus' answer, he said, God seeks those who worship him in spirit and truth, first of all. Secondly, he said, the time is coming where they will not worship the Father on this mountain or in that mountain, and we know he came. The Bible says that after that, she, she looked at Jesus and she said, I know when the Messiah comes, he will tell us all things. And then Jesus looks at her and flat out, like, like, like not in parables or like, like, like figure of speech kind of thing, he clearly tells her, I am he. And she met the Messiah. What is amazing to, about that story is like, she even left her can, run back to the town, told the people, come see a man. Can he be the Messiah? The beauty of that is, they came out to Jesus. And because of her word, they believed. But later on, they turned around, they looked at her and said, no longer do we believe because of your word. We have seen ourselves. Jesus came to this woman, and I really trust the Lord to do the same for you today. This woman came to the well because she needed water. We can, can discuss and talk about it, why she came in the middle of the day. But I really believe when Jesus encountered her, when he actually offered her living water, basically the first encounter with Jesus she needed was to realize, I need him. 
In the same way, that is the first step to take us towards God. I need Him. That realization, I need Him. For the wages of sin is death. Like, like I'm going to die because of my sin. But I need Him. In the same way, that's often the very step away from Him. It's like in our relationship with Him, where that was our first step towards Him in relationship, the first step away from Him is we neglect to realize our need of Him. Secondly, Jesus asked her to call your husband. And I really believe what Jesus offered her there was to say, like, you, you've tried this five and a half times. Five because she had, and the one she's having is not really her husband. So, so let's just call it five and a half. Like, like, he said, you've tried this five and a half times. You've tried this relationship. You've tried this intimacy. And I really believe that Jesus is saying, like, the ultimate bridegroom is standing in front of you. He was revealing to her, but not only her desire, but her need for intimacy. Without intimacy with him, there truly is not going to be wholeness, will not be whole. And every other relationship will in the end actually be meaningless. So I believe Jesus wanted to restore her. I remember Evangelist Bonke once, it's just, just I came to mind, preaching in the Western Germany. And he like gave an altar call and people got saved. And then afterwards he was having coffee. And a young girl came, like, came up to him and, and he asked her the question like, have you received Jesus tonight? And she looked at him and she said like, oh no, but, but how do I wish I could? And, and he was puzzled for a moment. It was like, like, you wish you could, but you didn't like, like, what's going on? And she responded to him saying, like, like, I really want to receive Jesus. I love him. But my boyfriend hates Jesus and will not allow me to serve Jesus. So Evangelist Bonke responded like, I think any pastor was like, if your boyfriend's the reason you're not serving Jesus, you have the wrong boyfriend. And she looked at him and she was like, like, I really love him. And she turned around and she ran away from Evangelist Bonke. He was still there a couple of days. So the following morning, he was having breakfast with, with, with the pastors. Uh, not the pastors, but one pastor, the pastor of the church, they were having breakfast. When one of the elders ran in and, and, and kind of like, came, Pastor, Pastor, did you hear? And they were like shocked, like, no, what's going on? And they said that, that this young girl had just died in a car accident. And Evangelist Bonkley was struck. That's one of those moments that really defined and shaped his life. Um, he said immediately, like, the conviction came upon him, like, like, did I preach good enough? Did I present the gospel clear enough? And he said, like, he went into, like, a deep prayer, and the Lord released him from the burden, saying, you've done what you could. And, and, and part of the reason I'm sharing that is, so often in this life, we allow other things to come between us and God. The final discussion Jesus had with this woman Centered around worship. Every one of us has a need to worship. You're either going to worship Jesus, or you're going to worship something, or you're going to worship someone, or you might even worship yourself. And if we're really honest with one another, um, for the most part in our country, the, the, the worship of of like people, I mean, like it's a problem, but it's not as bad as the race of the wolf. But probably the biggest idol we need to overcome in this life is the idol of self. It is not about like falling down and worshiping yourself, thinking you are so amazing. So oftentimes, we take what happened to us, our circumstances, our hurts, and we place that on an altar and worship it. What you behold, you become. What your eyes are on. If your eyes are continually upon your hurts and what has happened to you, unable to forgive, you are worshiping. It's a form of worshiping self. You are worshiping what happened to you. 
Because you have allowed your circumstances to dethrone God and take the throne in your life. And I know this is a hard message. But, but sometimes we need to confront it to say, Jesus must be on the throne. We need the Spirit of God to set us free. You know, the Holy Spirit convicts of righteousness. I remember like before I really gave my life to God, like really had my encounter with Him. Like, like I mean, I would work hard to please God. In the same way I would work very hard to maintain my sinful life. But one of the things, like when the conviction of the righteousness that comes through faith in Christ comes, it sets you free from trying to please the Lord through works. It is liberating. Revelations chapter 2. Jesus is saying something again to the Ephesians. It's a letter to the church in, in Ephesians. And, and I really believe that that's what God is inviting us to to this day. He kind of like speaks to them and he says, like, and, and he honors them for all their works and what they're doing. Basically, if you would read the first part of that letter, it would seem like the perfect church. He said, you hate the, um, Afrikaans says, Nicoluita, Mark. I don't know how to pronounce it in English. I've tried to figure it out. I still couldn't. Help me, Pastor Bruce. He can't say it as well. So praise God, it's not so bad on my bow. But, but basically what that means is like Jesus honors them. He said, you hate people with one foot in the church and one foot in the, uh, in the world. You hate people of compromise. He said, I've seen your works. I've seen all your deeds. I've seen what you're doing. And if you read that, the perfect church. But then Jesus turns around. And he says, I have this against you. You have left your first love. Do you remember in the beginning when you went out, like, encountering Jesus? Man, you would clean the toilets if Pastor Bruce would ask you to. It wasn't trouble. You loved the Lord. If you came to church, it wasn't like, like to have a ministry. Everything you did just flow from, I just want to do something for Jesus. Why? Out of gratitude. And then somewhere along the line, we start having ministries and titles and, and all these sorts of things. And we leave the first love. Then we are going, basically what happens, we get to that place where we are striving because we want to be seen. We are striving because we want to be recognized and approved by people. And people need to see the anointing on my life. Instead of just beholding Him. One of the, the like, really, this is just, just a side note. Pastor Bruce, like, I have many side notes today, but I didn't plan on sharing this this morning. But I remember the first day I arrived in Orlando, and I'm very excited because we are privileged to be part of a, a small group of people, and we're going to spend time with Evangelist Kulenda, and we have all these dreams of what God's going to do. And I remember walking into, like, like the, the training hall basically a day before like, like, Stephen has very strict code about being on time. Like, if you're not early, you are late. Uh, Evangelist Bonke was German, so everything is, like, like precise. Like, like very un-American in America. But, but we were there, and I remember the day before, I wanted to see what the traffic would be like, how it, what, what, uh, uh, to make sure I'm in time at class. Because Evangelist Kalina, if you're late twice, he sends you home. Because he thinks you're not serious. Like, like so, so I was like, I'm going to be serious. I, I'm going to be the best. I don't know what to call it. That's it. I don't even think of myself as an evangelist, but I'll be the best he has ever seen. Like, I'm going to be punctual. And I remember walking into the, the, the training hall, and there was like, like this, this Mexican guy cleaning toilets, by the way, when I walked in there. And I remember I saw him, and my mind's like janitor, greeted him very politely. Um, by God's grace, I'm a pastor, so I greet all people. 
like, so greeted him. And, and I remember, like, I've, I've seen the place, like, okay, and I went home. Next day, class starts, I think, like, three, four days in. Evangelist Kalina goes, like, I want to introduce you to Daniel. And I was like, Daniel's anointed name in America, apparently. But so, so he wants to introduce us to Daniel, and Daniel walks in. And when Daniel walks in, I looked and was like, I've met this guy before. He walks in, the same Mexican, married to a South African, but Mexican walking in, who cleaned the toilets when no one was at CFAN. Walks in, takes the microphone, and I still think probably one of the most anointed messages I've heard in my time in America. Led millions to Jesus. Millions. No one knows him. I didn't know him. But Daniel Garcia that day taught me a lesson. He didn't clean toilets when Evangelist Colenda was looking out for him or would see him. Apart from me, who arrived unexpectedly, no one would have known that guy's busy cleaning toilets. I've learned from him what it's like to pursue Jesus, to love Jesus. And if the Lord trusts me to have this in my hand, I'm grateful for the opportunity. But my first ministry is to love him and to love him well. Now, in the book of Revelations, the invite Jesus gave, he said, to him who overcomes. The letter starts off between him who dwells, between the, the seven tzikandalara, the candles. See, if I preach my known messages, I know what English words to use. But he walks between the seven candlesticks. He speaks of the presence of the Holy Spirit. That's where he starts, and he starts talking about their works, and then he said, you have left your first love. But then he ends it off with this. He said, to him who overcome, I will give to him to eat from the tree of life. Basically what he's saying, I will give myself to him. And today Jesus has given that opportunity to you as a church. Not, I mean, we all want anointing, and we all want to do these amazing things. But I really feel in my heart the invite Jesus is giving you as a church today. So I want to give myself to him. It's not titles. It's not about that. It's not about the ministry. Trust me when I tell you, even ministry can, can become an idol in your life. That we get so attached to what I'm doing for the Lord. What is your, your, your time with Jesus like? Because with this Samaritan woman, basically what he brought her back to, he said, I'm the one you need. I'm the one, the first priority of relationship that you need. And lastly, you need to worship me. Is it still the desire of your heart? Because if Jesus has first place in your life, your first thought in the morning would be, I need to go spend time with him. One third of our time in Orlando with Evangelist Kalenda was about spending time with God. Hard thing for evangelists to do because you just want to run and do like people are perishing. But we cannot sustain the life we need to with Christ apart from Christ. I'd like to pray a prayer over you this morning. But if that is you today, you're just like, man, Lord, I, I really want to. If you said, I can eat from the tree of life this morning, and I need to fix my heart and make right with you today. I'm going to do a corporate prayer. I'm not going to ask you to stand up. Because it's, it's not the altar call. It's just an invite, I believe in my heart, that Jesus is handing you this morning. To say that if you want more. If it's not, 
like, like so often we preach this, man, and we did it last week and the weekend before, like, like if you want the fire and the anointing, and, and, and there's time for that. But I really feel like in my heart what Jesus is offering you as a church this morning is something greater than that. And I just want you to, to close your eyes and just, just, you can just pray in your heart after me. I know I delivered the message the Lord laid on my heart. I, I don't need to see hands or to, like, like it really is an invite for you. And you know in your heart if this is what you want and what you are praying for. If you can just, just pray after me like, and pray with me. Jesus, we thank you for this morning. We thank you that you love us and that you have loved us, Lord, even while we were still sinners. This morning, Jesus, you have given this church the invite to not only eat and partake, but to enjoy the tree of life, to enjoy you. For you have life and life abundantly in store for each and every one. Lord, I pray this morning for every heart that has turned cold towards you. Every heart that has not fixed its eyes upon you. Every heart that has left the first love. And I ask you today, Lord, to make it new. Restore unto us the first love again. We repent from our lukewarmness. We repent for forsaking our first love. And this morning, Jesus, we turn to you. I pray, Lord, for dreams and visions and encounters with you. I pray for eyes to see and ears to hear you, Lord. Eyes that are focused and fixed on you. That we do ministry as a service unto you. And I really ask you this morning, Lord, to take away this entitlement we have towards ministry. Like I have a right to do anything. But instill in us a grateful heart, knowing, Lord, that it is, it is a gift you have given us. It is by your grace. Rekindle the fire within Jesus. In your mighty name I pray. Amen and amen.